7 p.m. So I guess we're going to get started. Um, my name is Paul Ligeti, and I am the vice president of the Historical Society of West Windsor, um, which is a 100% volunteer nonprofit that was founded in 1983 for the purpose of preserving and promoting the town's history. And, you know, hopefully we're all here. You know, it's wonderful to see everyone here, and hopefully we're all here to uh, watch Electric Culture Train to cut, stop and cast an eye. Uh, we will learn about the architecture and archaeology of cemeteries throughout New Jersey. Um, you know, and, and this also relates to West Windsor because in West Windsor we have about 1,900 burials uh, spread throughout mainly three uh, 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 big cemeteries. There's the Dutch Back Presbyterian Church Cemetery, which we're seeing here, that dates to the mid 1700s. Oldest gravestone is 1771, um, and that has about 1,200 gravestones. There is the Princeton Baptist Church Cemetery on Route One and uh, Washington Road. Its oldest gravestone is 1815, and that has about 650 uh, burials. And uh, there is also a much older and defunct cemetery called the Skank Covenhoven Cemetery, uh, just across Route 1 from the Princeton Baptist Church, and that dates to 1746. Um, and, you know, cemeteries can be wonderful uh, sources of historic and, uh, and cultural research and, uh, you know, just appreciation for your township, as uh, you can imagine. So, uh, uh, you know, it's good that everyone's here to learn about the cemeteries. Now, our guest speaker tonight is uh, Professor Richard Veit. He is a, prof uh, he is a professor of anthropology and interim dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Monmouth University. So a big thank you to him for being here. And in addition to exploring New Jersey cemeteries in general, again, he has specifically designed part of this presentation to uh, incorporate a few of West Windsor's burial grounds and stones as well. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, so, but before we get into the lecture, um, I just like to give some, and you know, some of you have been to our past meetings might actually see, have uh, you know, seen this before. Um, uh, I'd just like to give some context uh, uh, as to where this lecture fits in with the Historical Society's yearly calendar. And so in 1797, uh, West Windsor was formed meaning that this year, 2022, it turns 225 years old. So tonight's presentation is actually just one of a few dozen events the Historical Society is overseeing to commemorate this anniversary. It's something we're calling uh, year 225. Um, so as, as part of that, again, it's West Windsor's 225th birthday celebrations, we're working with several local organizations and the municipal government throughout 2022 to oversee historic panels and lectures such as this, uh, reenactments, history tours, and all many, many or more events that you can see on the calendar here. There's about three dozen. Um, in addition, we have a number of ongoing projects um, in the works, such as uh, permanent educational markers in various historic communities in West Windsor, um, art installations, and even a uh, West Windsor history book. Um, and actually, uh, related to this uh, lecture, we're also in the works of, uh, you know, preserving the Skank Calvin Hope and Cemetery. So that, that's you know, uh, uh, something that you can look forward to in the future. Uh, so you can visit the link shown at the bottom of the screen here to learn a lot more about our upcoming plans and how to provide support to the Historical Society and our U225 events. So um, I strongly encourage all of you, if you have not done so already, to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and obviously to take note of our website, which is that first link. Uh, we also, uh, 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 you know, you can check into e e each of these sites for routine updates on U225, project and events, and a lot more. Um, we also publish a monthly uh, newspaper column uh, about West Windsor history, a variety of different historical topics, which is this, um, uh, you know, icon, this uh, image in the top right corner. Um, also note that we're selling a year 225 memorabilia which you can use, uh, purchase to support the Historical Society and show off township pride. So this include, uh, includes things like clothing, flags, drinkware, card magnets, and even uh, historic maps of the township. Uh, the mugs in particular are produced by Unified Spectrum, which employs and empowers neurodivergent community members. Now, finally, some things to point out, out about this uh, meeting. So after I'm done speaking, I'm gonna hand it off to Professor Wright, who will give his lecture. Afterwards, there will be a question and answer session. Um, so feel free to ask questions during or after the lecture uh, to Professor Veit, uh, you know, obviously on the subject matter of the cemeteries, uh, 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 using the uh, Zoom's built-in chat function. And if you haven't used uh, Zoom before, it's the little speech bubble icon usually found at the bottom of your screen. Um, so Nyla Montgomery is actually here with us, and uh, she is a fellow Historical Society volunteer. 
And she and I will trade off asking uh, Professor Veit uh, the questions that you actually post in the chat. So, you know, feel free to, you know, ask whatever you want related, you know, related to cemeteries. And, uh, you know, either now and I could also answer questions that you might have about West Windsor specific cemetery uh, and graveyard questions. Uh, so, you know, we apologize in advance if we can't get to everyone's questions, uh, depending on, you know, the number of questions asked and the uh, time limit that we want to uh, uh, stick to. But other than that, uh, uh, you know, once again, thank you to everyone for being here. And obviously, you know, thank you, Professor Veit, for being here. And to whatever extent any, anyone can, you know, please give Professor Veit a very warm welcome. So, you know, please take it away. Right. Paul, thank you so much for that great introduction. And let me see if I can pull up the presentation. I'm also blown away by the calendar of events you have. I want to come to the War of the World celebration. All right, so let me dive in. Um, tonight's presentation is really going to be sort of, I used to call this a whirlwind tour of New Jersey's historic cemeteries, but I kept adding more and more stuff. Uh, so it's, it's not quite a whirlwind anymore. It'll go on for a little bit, but I look forward to your questions. And this is an introduction to New Jersey's historic burial grounds and grave markers. And it's based on work that I did over a number of years with a good friend and colleague, Mark Nonestide from the Middlesex County Cultural and Heritage Commission and resulted in a book that we published through Rutgers University Press. So when folks think of cemeteries and graveyards, they often think of them as scary, spooky places to be avoided as long as humanly possible. And this painting uh, called The Thunderer I think exemplifies that, a group of terrified people in a cemetery. Hopefully this evening I'll provide you with a different view of historic cemeteries as important repositories for information about local history uh, that are worth studying. Unfortunately, many of them are also endangered. And I thought I would show this image as an example of an endangered grave marker this is at the Church on the Green in Hackensack, New Jersey. It's a sandstone or brownstone marker from 1815. And you can see how it is peeling apart before our very eyes. So it probably won't be there for future generations. So there's some urgency to documenting what remains in our early burial grounds. One thing to think about, and Paul shared with me some photographs of West Windsor uh, burial grounds and grave markers, um, that often what we see when we visit a burial ground is not everything that's there. It's sort of the tip of the iceberg um, because it was very common in the 18th and 19th centuries to have wooden and other folk markers like this one. This is at a place called At Zion down in the Pine Barrens. And it's shaped, this is actually called a head and shoulders marker, which makes me laugh because I think of the shampoo but it's shaped like a little person standing there, but this is a wooden marker. And you can imagine markers like this, which were once very, very common, have a limited lifespan. When I started researching New Jersey's burial grounds with my colleague, uh, Mark, we wanted to try and be as inclusive as possible because one of the things that I think is really wonderful about our state is that it is a state that is incredibly diverse. Um, and we thought it was important to represent our Native American heritage as well. Whoop, going back. And this is a Native American, a marker for a Native American or an indigenous person buried in Burlington City, New Jersey. Uh, a man named Akinikin, who was a, a Lenape leader who died in 1681. There's a great inscription there, right? Be plain and fair to all, both Indian and Christian, as I have been. But you'll notice that the marker actually didn't go up until 1930, and it was erected by YMCA and YWCA campers. So monuments often speak to times long past, as this one does. This marker is also reputed to be for a Native American. Again, it's sandstone, and this is in a Hackensack. It's kind of irregularly shaped. It's got odd carving on it. Um, you can see some initials, II or perhaps HB, some arrows on either side, a date down here, 1713, pretty early. This shape, which may be a canoe, 
and this carving, which to me looks a bit like a Native American tobacco pipe. But we don't know for sure. In fact, when we asked the sexton, the person in charge of the burial ground at this cemetery, um, if this was a grave for a Native American, he said, I think so, but our records are really incomplete. So it's hard for us to say for sure. This is uh, up in Succasana in Morris County, New Jersey. And I found this to be an interesting modern marker for ancient Native Americans. Uh, whose graves were apparently uh, disturbed, uh, as well as the graves of some uh, congregants of this church when uh, the fellowship hall was constructed in the 1960s. European settlers and, um, and African Americans as well uh, began arriving in New Jersey in the late 1600s. Um, I found this to be a particularly curious gravestone. This is way down in uh, South Jersey in Cumberland County and uh, marks the site of uh, Cohansey Baptist Church. But I found it curious that it also called out Deborah Swinney, uh, the first white child born in this area in 1683. And she lived a good long life. She died in 1760. So she was really a arriving in an area that was almost entirely frontier at the time. So I have some favorite gravestones and I'll be showing them to you. This is one, this is more properly a tombstone laid flat on a tomb. And this is in Piscataway Town, New Jersey, um, in a burial ground shared by Baptist and Episcopal uh, churches. And uh, it's quite early. You can see the date, 1693. The landscaping is modern, but the inscription is really something I won't read it all to you. I'll give you the highlights. It says, spectators underneath this tomb lie two boys that lay in one womb. And then it goes on and notes that twice told by Eating's mushroom for food, rare in a day's time they poisoned were. So these two boys, Richard and Charles Hooper, who died in 1693, apparently ate poisoned mushrooms. And someone told them not once, but twice, not to eat the poisoned mushrooms. And you could see the very sad result of their not listening here in a kind of amazing tombstone from early America. This is another tombstone, it's a fragment um, and it's in the cellar or basement of St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Freehold. It was moved from an early burial ground in uh, Marlborough called uh, Toponemus Burial Ground. And it's for Thomas Warren, and it gives you a little bit of his biography. And I think it's interesting because of that. It says he was born in Plymouth, in Devonshire, in Great Britain, and he lived some time in Ireland. And in the 51st year of his age, he came over a proprietor and it's broken off, but it said East Jersey. And I love that because I've lived most of my life in New Jersey with some brief periods in Virginia and Philadelphia. But people say that New Jerseyans have accents. I don't think that's the case. But East Jersey almost sounds like pirate talk. I mean, it's just fantastic. So I wonder if that's the way they were talking in the late 1600s. This is another early marker uh, in Elizabeth's First Presbyterian uh, Churchyard. And if you're interested in colonial uh, graveyards, that is the graveyard to visit or the cemetery to visit. And it's from Miss Sarah Woodruff who died in 1727 and she was 62. But it's really the carving that's extraordinary. So we have a skull with crossbones, right? Remem uh, remembrance of our mortality. We have an hourglass. Think of the old daytime soap opera, like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. A pair of birds, maybe ravens or crows. But my favorite thing of all is this design on the sides. And when I saw that, I thought I was looking at waves. And I said that to my wife. I had dragged her along on this cemetery safari. And she said, uh, like, no, I, I don't think so. I, I think those are flames licking the whole picture. And uh, I think she's right. Uh, so it's kind of a scary, grim image. And people have asked me if Sarah Woodruff was a pirate. So I don't think she was. There were some women who were pirates and there were pirates uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, certainly in the 1700s, 
I think she was probably a, a Puritan, and the Puritans thought that most people uh, were not going to heaven, only a select group were. And because of that, they were pretty concerned with the state of their souls. And I think this gravestone speaks to that concern. Now, here's another very early marker. Uh, and this is a photo that uh, Paul shared with me. As I understand it, it's the oldest marker in West Windsor. It appears like it might be carved on argillite or another local stone, and you can faintly see the initial M up there and the date 1746. Well, I don't know if you want to add anything about it, but I thought it was a great example of a folk marker. Yeah, no, so th this this um, marker, again, I, I, you were right, it is the oldest one that we know of in West Windsor. This is located in a cemetery called the Skank Covenhoven Cemetery, which is located west of Route 1 and north of Washington Road, still in West Windsor. Um, it's across the road from the Princeton Baptist Church. And 1746 is right around the time that West Windsor started being settled by its first families. So this would have been one of the founding members of West Windsor. Um, it's a little hard to tell what that second initial is. Uh, you know, after M, it could be an I, it could be something else. If it is an I, it's a little, uh, 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 we can't quite tell who it would be. If it's a different letter, we would have, you know, a better, you know, if it was a K, for example, we might know it's part of the Covenhoven family. Uh, but with that little, with that little crossbar that you see, the horizontal line, it might be an I with the crossbar or, some, or something similar. Um, but yeah, again, oldest in West Windsor, and you know, it, we're, when we're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, when was West, Southern, West Windsor settled? This cemetery, the Skank Covenhoven Cemetery, which has about 80 to, uh, 80 to 100 graves, is kind of the thing that we at the Historical Society look to as one of the original things of West Windsor. Thanks, Paul. All right, moving on. Uh, these are not too far away. These are in Pennington. But I show you these gravestones because they show you the range of markers we might see in a colonial cemetery, from almost homemade sort of markers for Sarah Wilson here and these others, and others that are professionally carved. So carving starts to develop as a craft in the colonies in the 1600s and is really going strong by the late 1700s. This is another uh, favorite example of mine. Uh, this is for a fellow named David Lyell. He's uh, the state's first uh, jeweler, if you will. He was a goldsmith and silversmith. He uh, is buried by St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Freehold, and it has a coat of arms on it. And I love this because so far as we know, David Lyell, while an interesting individual, was not a nobleman. But here he is in a new world, and I think it gives people the opportunity to sort of inflate their resumes, if you will. Um, and he may do in, maybe doing a little bit of that by creating this beautiful coat of arms. Even notice the knight's helmet up here. These are Actually, more Richard, do you mind, do you mind if I, oh, sorry, Richard. Oh, Paul, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry, do you mind if I interrupt for a second? Um, people might actually recognize David. Uh, that's the, you're presenting a number of figures that uh, I, I didn't know you'd be presenting these, but it actually ends up relating to Westminster history. David Lyle is actually the second half of the name Penn Lyle Road. He owned about 6,000 acres in West Windsor, and the division line between his, his property and the property of a man named William Penn, who is the founder of Pennsylvania, actually is Penn Law Road. It's built along that division line. So he, he's one of the earliest and one of the largest landowners in West Windsor. Oh my goodness. I will have to remember that for future presentations. Thank you. Um, here are two other sort of more typical New Jersey markers from the middle of the 1700s. On our left, we have Alexander Clark, and I know there are early Clarks in the Princeton area as well. Um, and this Clark was buried in uh, Toponemus Burial Ground. What I think is interesting about it is not only do we have a skull and crossbones, but you can actually see that all the sand is at the bottom of his hourglass, kind of sad for Mr. Clark. But it also points out that he died with the cancer and I think that is very unusual for a colonial grave marker because many cancers would not have left sort of an overt trace. So he may have had a tumor or something that his uh, doctor was aware of. On the right, we have Michael Reynolds, who's born in Ireland near Mullingenar. Uh, he's buried up in Ringwood, New Jersey. And uh, one of the things that I think is fun here is Irish immigrants often uh, put on their gravestones where they were from. Uh, it seems to be common practice, and he certainly does that. 
Now this is a, a marker that's a little bit different. So it's, it's not really a mortality image. It's not a scary skull, but it's not a cherub or an angel yet either. Uh, this is uh, in Tewksbury, Lamington area. And to me, it looks like Teddy Roosevelt sort of with the glasses and the mustache there. Um, so it's a little bit of a transition from one style to another. Here is a more well-developed uh, cherub uh, or angel. Jim Dietz and Edwin Deplison, who studied these markers or markers like these in New England, argued that there was a major religious shift, the Great Awakening in the middle of the 1700s. And with that shift, people begin to believe in salvation through faith and they start to have more optimistic outlook on the world and the gravestones reflect that. My colleague at Monmouth, Adam Heinrich, has pointed out that this cultural shift relates to larger uh, shifts in artistic designs also happening about the same time. In either case, this is a wonderful example of a cherub. You should uh, bear in mind that John Bigelow, who's uh, buried up in um, East Hanover, did not look like this. This is not John himself. This is sort of a generic image uh, carved by a fellow that we call the East Jersey Soul Carver. Here's another uh, early cherub, and this example is in uh, Pennington. And I particularly like uh, that it points out where, where Mr. Greed was from, that he was born on Jamaica on Long Island. A couple other early examples, sandstone markers. Uh, the one on the left is in the Westfield Presbyterian Churchyard, and the one on the right is in Woodbridge. I show you the one on the left because it has a great shape. It looks like a Coca-Cola bottle, uh, but it's probably an hourglass again. The other thing that's fun about it, it just may take you back to elementary school, is you can see the vowels down here, A, E, I, O, U, and Y. And I imagine the carver saying to maybe an apprentice, uh, Abner, give me those vowels one more time, but put them someplace inconspicuous. And he put them down sort of where the grass would have hid them. This marker by the same carver, Ebenezer Price, who uh, worked in Elizabeth, very interesting. It's for a fellow who died during the revolution, Nathaniel Fitz Randolph, died in 1780, he was 33. Um, Note the swords on either side of the stone, the cross swords above the cherub. The backstory here is that after Captain Fitz Randolph fell at the Battle of Connecticut Farms, British soldiers used his gravestone for target practice. So we're actually seeing the impact of musket balls. And that appears to be, I know that's a folkloric answer, but that appears to be the case. This is another fun one, um, believe it or not. Uh, this is for Mrs. Catherine Eckley, and there's a there's a sad story here that deserves more investigation. So I'm only showing you part of the marker, but you can see there's a coffin, and the lid is a jar, and there's Mrs. Eckley, and it says Ebenezer Price Sculptor. So he was really happy with this one. So the backstory here is that Mrs. Eckley had gone with her husband to visit their son, who was attending Princeton, then the College of New Jersey, and they were coming home one day uh, up and down the hills of Morris County. And Mr. Eckley had uh, gotten out of the carriage to make it easier on the horses. And Mrs. Eckley was still in the carriage and she was peeling an apple with a pen knife uh, when they hit a bump, the most unfortunate bump. And Mrs. Eckley ended up stabbing herself with the pen knife and expiring right there. And her husband erected a wonderful tribute to her um, but I tend to think that Mr. Eckley's very lucky that they didn't have detectives or forensic scientists because it just seems a little too contrived. Like, why didn't he say, "Hun, you're about to hit a big bump. Maybe put the knife down. Is it really safe to be carving apples while going over bumpy roads? But none of that. So, and this story has actually been retold since she passed away. It shows up in a book of famous Early American Epitaphs, published in 1810. Here's another uh, West Windsor example, a great marker, 1771 for David Copenhagen. And um, in looking at this, to me, this appears to be the work of uh, a pair of brothers who carved in Eastern New Jersey. Um, 
David, uh, Jonathan Hand Osborne and David Osborne. David was in um, Woodbridge. Jonathan Hand Osborne was in Scotch Plains. And their, their charms look a lot like this. Uh, Paul, again, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add about this. And thank you for sharing this photo with me. Yeah, of course. Um, the only the only thing I would add is again, this is the uh, we we had previously seen the oldest in West Windsor. Now this is the oldest at the Dutch Neck Presbyterian Church at the intersection. So so for West Windsor residents at the at the intersection of South Mill Road and Village Road East and West. And um, uh, uh, you know the the Kavenhovens uh, or how it's spelled here, Kallenhovens are the uh, are one of the oldest families in West Windsor, um, whose name changed over time into Conover. Uh, so people might be more familiar with that. Very good. All right, this is a, another interesting early grave marker. One of the things to look for when looking at early gravestones is the epitaph, the inscription typically rhyming on the bottom. So this is uh, up in Sakasana. It's for uh, a low skinning, a wife of Silas, very young when she passed away, 25. And... Um, Get this epitaph. My, it's not. It's not really. It has a great rhyme, but it's not so upbeat. My fellow youths, though young and gay, you must ere long be turned to clay, and as you would be truly wise, be ready for the last surprise. Uh, so it is sort of humorous for a gravestone. Now, um, cemeteries and graveyards are also interesting in that sometimes people show up in them. Um, and this is what you might call a colonial status symbol. It's a big box tomb made out of a type of limestone imported from Great Britain that does not survive our local acid rain very well. And it's in, it's in rough shape, but it's in St. Peter's Churchyard in Perth Amboy. Uh, here is another uh, example of a box tomb like that. Uh, this one again is in Pennington. One of the challenges with these is that folks often Vandals often lift the tops off, hoping to see a skeleton staring back at them. The person is actually buried underground. They're not, they're not in that box. We can see some gendered behavior in a uh, grave marker selection as well. So this is a grave marker for Catherine Thane um, and Mary, for Catherine, the daughter rather, of Daniel Thane and Mary Close, who died in 1771. She was 20. Um, and the thing to take away from it is the different flowers. So some, they look like tulips. Some are in full bloom, some are just blooming, and others are wilting, wilting away. Today, if you want a gravestone, well, you might go on online to find a carver. But in the 18th century, you couldn't do that. And this is Mary Dunham's marker from Piscataway shows us one solution to the problem of finding a good carver. So you'll see the initials up at the top, MD, right? Just like you might have on a sweater. And then this is for Mary Dunham, wife of John Dunham, who died in 1795. But here's a curious thing, Jonathan and Osborne, 1796. So Jonathan and Osborne is not buried here. He carved the stone and he put his name right at the top, almost more prominent than Mrs. Dunham. So I guess if you were in the cemetery and you were saying, you know, we might be needing a gravestone and you looked over, you would see it and you would say, hmm, I like Jonathan Hand Osborne's work. So it seems a little bit crass to be advertising that way. Different parts of the state have sort of different regional cultures. If we go up to uh, far northeastern New Jersey, Bergen, Passaic, and Hudson counties, we get uh, Dutch language grave markers, such as this one for Abraham Ackerman, uh, who died in 1791. This is from New Brunswick, um, and it's a great little marker. Um, it's uh, for an individual named Johannes Martinus uh, von Harlingen. He came from a place called Westbrook in Holland, and he passed away in 1768 at Lawrence's Brook by New Brunswick in New Jersey. And it's actually carved by a fellow named uh, Johann Zuricker, who was bilingual, both in Dutch and English. Northwestern New Jersey, Warren, parts of Hunterdon and Somerset, and Sussex counties, rather, had substantial German populations. And here are some examples of uh, German 
markers. These small ones in the Green Family Cemetery are Moravian markers. And Moravians felt that everyone was equal in the eyes of God, so you don't need big, elaborate gravestones. The fellow over here on our right, uh, John George Windemuth, was not Moravian. Um, and he put his whole, or he had his whole biography put on the stone. It says that he was born in 1711 in Pungstad in Europe. There was no Germany yet. He came to America in 1736. He married uh, Maria Elizabeth Bernhardt in 1739. They had eight children. Uh, he lived, uh, they lived together in marriage 43 years and three months. He passed away in 1782. Uh, on the 10th of December at 10 o'clock in the evening. I mean, it's like too much information, right? Um, and he was 71 years old and they had uh, three sons, three daughters still living when he passed away. So this is like a genealogist fantasy come true. The other thing is up at the top, you could see something strange going on. It actually looks like there was a cherub or a face carved on it that was then scratched out. And just initials were put there. And I wonder if the, the family members found the face somehow inappropriate. This is a fun uh, early gravestone in um, Rumson, New Jersey, Monmouth County. And it's for Joyce Hans. It's carved out of slate, which means it was almost certainly made in New England. And the thing that I think is fun here is the date. It looks like she died December or February, right? February the 4th. Uh, 172 and two thirds. So is it, you want to say, did they not know which year it was? They did know which year it was, but they were starting their new year in the spring rather than the way we started um, on January 1st. And they sort of did uh, 1722, 1723 to make all readers happy. A lot of our early markers in New Jersey, particularly in southern New Jersey, though this is a, an example from Pluckerman, which is not southern New Jersey, were carved uh, on marble or a very grainy marble or limestone quarried in, uh, often in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. This is an interesting one. Uh, it's for, you can barely read it, the Honorable Captain William Leslie of the 17th British Regiment, son of the Earl of Leven in Scotland. It gets even harder to read, but it says he fell on, um, I think it's January 3rd, 1777, aged 26 years in the Battle of Princeton. So this is a British officer who's badly wounded at Princeton. He's, he's taken north um, by the American troops who control the battlefield in the hopes of taking him to an American hospital where he may survive. Unfortunately, he passes away. But then what's even more interesting is you'll note that his friend, Benjamin Rush, MD of Philadelphia, erected this stone. So Benjamin Rush is probably the most famous physician in early America. And um, he's closely associated with Princeton University in the area around Princeton. Um, he is on the battlefield treating American wounded after the battle. And he comes across this young man whom he recognizes. And he is the one who has a uh, young William Leslie uh, taken away with the American troops. Uh, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, Rush had lived at Leslie's parents' house uh, when he studied medicine in Scotland. And he had proposed to Leslie's sister who rejected him. Uh, so this uh, must have been a very awkward battlefield meeting. If I don't know if there are any uh, realtors uh, online this evening, but you know, in real estate, location is everything. Um, so sometimes we find early uh, tombstones inside of cemeteries and or inside of churches, rather. If you think of uh, the great cathedrals in in Europe, like perhaps Westminster Cathedral. So this is a tombstone for Elizabeth Ashfield, wife of the Honorable Lewis Morris Ashfield. Uh, she is uh, one of the leading lights of colonial uh, Monmouth County, and she's buried inside Christ Episcopal Church.
which preserved her gravestone very, very well. New Jersey has had an African-American population ever since uh, it was founded as a colony. Um, and often that goes overlooked or unstudied. But sometimes in burial grounds, we can find interesting and sometimes poignant and even troubling reminders of that. So this is a gravestone in the Woodbridge Presbyterian Churchyard. Now the original stone, which was sandstone, failed and the parishioners paid for a new stone out of granite because they felt it was particularly important. And you'll read that it commemorates Jack, who's described as a colored man who belonged to a phrase we would probably find offensive today, Jonathan Freeman, and it notes that he was a faithful servant and died in 1825 in the 43rd year of his age. And then we have initials at the top that could be Jack Freeman, J.F., could be Jonathan Freeman, not entirely clear. I think this probably does reflect a very uh, a special relationship between these two individuals um, because Jonathan chose to erect a marker for Jack um, but it also speaks to the fact that many people were enslaved during this time period and were not in a position to erect their own grave markers. Uh, we've looked at a lot of gravestones so far, and I don't think I've shown you any crosses. So crosses were not seen as really appropriate gravestone decorations in early America. Uh, they were seen as associated with Catholics, and Catholics were uh, a minority in colonial America. Um, but this is a rare example. It's a little bit later, 1828, and it's in Madison's Bottle Hill Cemetery, and it's for a French immigrant. And he was buried sort of over at the edge of the cemetery, away from the center, um, but he does have a cross on his gravestone, and he's almost certainly a Roman Catholic. All right, so we're at the end of the 18th century, and here's an amazing archival discovery from uh, Rutgers University's Alexander Library, and it's an advertisement for the stonecutter Aaron Ross. And I love what he says here. He's going to take care of all orders with punctuality and neatness. Like as a professor, that's what I want for my students, right? Punctuality and neatness. But sometimes things go wrong, and mistakes on gravestones can be fun to look for. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at the sandstone marker from Martha formerly wife of Michael Moore and late wife of Samuel Jacques. So apparently when she passed away, her surviving husband commissioned a gravestone, but the carver got the husband's names in the wrong order, which must've been very awkward. Um, and this was discovered and then the offending name was rubbed out. You could, I mean, it's hard to erase on sandstone. <laughs> And they put the right name in and then finished the stone. I hope she got, I hope her heirs got a really good deal on this. Sometimes we can also find just amazing stories. And this is the marker for Abraham Van Gilder. Uh, and you'll see here, it says Abra he's buried in the Stelton section of, um, of Edison, almost close to the Piscataway border. In memory of Abraham Van Gilder, born on the high seas, October 1701. So imagine Mrs. Van Gilder in some little, little ship crossing from England or the Netherlands to North America, giving birth. That had to be ridiculously uncomfortable. Departed this life February the 28th, 1818, aged 116 years, four months. This guy is a survivor, right? He's got grit. He's not going anywhere. Then the, the fine print down here, epitaph, is really interesting. Rebel against heaven, this man had been, full years 116. By Christ's free grace, he then became an heir of God, a newborn son. So when I read this, what I thought was, oh my goodness, not only does he live to be 116 years old, but he's like an atheist. He won't join any church. So he's a rebel against heaven. And I shared this with some of my students, and they said that that was a cute explanation, but they didn't buy it. Um, they said he's a rebel against heaven because he's just not going. He stayed alive so long. And I think their explanation is, is better than mine. Uh, though I imagine him as like a 105-year-old and people saying like, don't you think you should get some religion, Abraham? Um, ultimately, he's buried in the Seventh-day Baptist churchyard. 
Sometimes gravestones aren't stones at all. And this is at the Pleasant Mills uh, burial ground by uh, Batstow in the Pine Barrens. And it's an iron gravestone, not really a stone, grave marker, made by folks who worked in um, the iron mill, the blast furnace that once stood at Batstow. You can see another one back here. Amazingly enough, the inscription, though it doesn't show up well in my photograph, is very legible today. It's from the 1820s. All right, so let's pretend we're not at home on Zoom, but we're sitting in a church, maybe the Baptist church uh, in West Windsor, and it's 1820 or so, and we look out the window and, wow, the burial ground is really crowded. We've got a problem. What are we going to do? And that can't be very healthy, having all those people packed in there right next to the church. So the big thing that happens, starting really in the 1830s and 40s, is we start to see cemeteries being created, where companies are incorporated, they buy big tracts of land outside of cities and towns, and they try and landscape them, and they sell plots to individuals. So different than the earlier colonial burial grounds or churchyards. And this is a fine example. This is in uh, New Brunswick. Often, uh, these new cemeteries will have really impressive gates so that you know when you're entering, you're someplace special. This is not ordinary. It's almost church-like. Uh, that's um, Mount Pleasant in Newark. Also, gravestones start to change. They start to evolve, to become three-dimensional, to become monuments rather than simply grave markers. And almost like picking out a high school class ring. There are books with all sorts of designs. And you can say, oh, yeah, I'd really like the lions on the side of my urn. Nah, no thanks to the cherubs. Did I have a flame on top of it? That would look really great. And each of these little accents has a different price. Uh, so this is, um, this is in Hunterdon County. This is the um, Hester Warren marker. And you can see this is probably the design that the Warrens picked out, uh, or the Bellises, her husband's name is John Bellis, picked out. And then they modified it, right? So instead of my husband, you have my wife up there. But the thing that I'd have you take away is there's this porcelain locket on this. And note the date, 1857. So if we look more closely, there is Hester Warren looking back at us in a picture from the 1850s. That's kind of amazing that it has survived outside. And uh, I think one of the things to think about is that we love our new technology, right? Our iPhones and all that. People in the 1850s loved their new technology too. It was just different than our new technology. Here is another nice mid-19th century uh, monument. I think this one's kind of funny because it shows a fellow in a cemetery at a gravestone on a gravestone. Some are very elaborate. This is in Camden um, and just beautiful carving up here. I mean, very artistic. There's some close-ups. We also get new designs that uh, folks in 18th century America would not have employed, right? Because uh, there have been archeological discoveries in Egypt and Rome. So here you see, what is purported to be the largest obelisk in the state, and it's in a cemetery in Neptune, New Jersey. It's for Henry Bennett, who made a fortune with vaudeville theaters, and um, it's really impressive. This is another one of my favorite Victorian markers. This is, uh, it's a granite sort of easy chair, um, and this is in uh, Gloucester County, and I have to say it, uh, actually, and I'm a little bit embarrassed by this, but it's actually a really comfortable chair. I've sat in it. You wouldn't think that a granite chair would be comfortable, but I've had some furniture in my house that's less comfortable than this. And here, again, these are just great, or several views of the same marker, I believe, uh, but a wonderful example of granite carving, again, from West Windsor. And uh, Paul, back to you if you want to if you want to elaborate on this at all. I would point out the, the sonic symbol, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I I, for, I forgot which member of the family was part of the Freemasons, but again, yeah, that's a Freemason symbol. And um, the, this is located at the Princeton Baptist Church Cemetery, which is at the intersection of Route One and Washington Road. 
Um, now, the High family, which is how you pronounce the name, they, they actually ran a general store in Princeton Junction. Um, so for people who know where Station Drive is, it's on the north side of the tracks, just next to the train station. Um, they ran the general store out of a building that is now a restaurant called Asian Bistro. Um, and that building has been around since the 1880s. Um, if not, if not, you know, maybe in the previous decade. So there, you know, there's a little bit more West Windsor history here, uh, you know, beyond the gravestone. And you'll notice a, the, the name Elizabeth Good, which is on the bottom left. Uh, 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 sorry, it's on the left picture uh, the, at the very bottom. Uh, she was actually a servant for the family. I believe she was actually a Hungarian immigrant. And um, uh, she, uh, uh, people who grew up in West Windsor in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s might remember her as someone who also delivered mail. She was, and she actually inherited a lot of the High family's property after uh, a, a number of these members passed away. Oh, that's fascinating. Thanks. Um, Victorians were also, and the Masonic symbol speaks this, they were big on joining organizations. Um, there's a sociologist who wrote a famous book called Bowling Alone about how we don't join enough organizations, but uh, Victorians love to be members of things. So this is the fireman's plot in um, Newark's um, Mount Pleasant Cemetery and wonderful statue of a fire captain up there. As we get closer, we can see, oh, let me go back, the gate. Notice the fire helmets. Notice the fire hoses, the ladders. Um, it's all tricked out for firemen. And then even funnier, the posts are all reused fire hydrants. So these guys were all about being firemen. Victorians were also very sentimental. And I think this marker for our little son, Wilson Stevens, uh, speaks to that, where you can see sort of a flower uh, broken off down here at the bottom. And they had ideas that today we would find, or I certainly find a little bit uncomfortable, like these uh, carved images of sleeping infants uh, in cemeteries. This is uh, another marker that speaks to um, Victorian sensibilities. And uh, this is uh, for Tilly Smith um, and uh, is up in the area of Centenary College in Hackettstown. Uh, Tilly Smith was a servant in the college and uh, she was sexually attacked and, and murdered uh, when only 19 years old and was buried in a pauper's grave. She didn't have a gravestone. People in the community were so upset by this uh, that they raised money uh, for a very beautiful uh, gravestone or tombstone for her. Sometimes um, grave markers aren't aren't stone at all. So Victorians loved, and you might find some of these in the area around West Windsor and Princeton uh, Heights Town as well. They love to experiment with things. So this is a grave marker in Long Branch that's actually made out of zinc. These were sold by a company called the Monumental Bronze Company. There's nothing bronze about them. I think they just thought that was a great title, marketing term. Um, and they were billed as cheaper than stone, lasting forever, uh, and impervious to the elements. And this one looks, it looks fantastic. And it's from the period right after the Civil War. So by the end of the 1800s, we have huge quarries that are now using steam power and pneumatic drills to quarry big blocks of stone in New England and in the South. Um, I love this photo, not only because it shows the fellows in the quarry, but because it reminds me of uh, the Looney Tune cartoons I watched as a kid. Notice this, and the Roadrunner. Notice this huge block of stone over this guy who's pretending to box with his friend. It's gotta be like six tons of granite. This could end very, very badly uh, for him. So we go from sort of folksy carving, the old way, to much more modern designs that are produced by uh, real artisans and craftsmen. Often they're very simple, uh, but elegant and beautiful, such as this Knapp family uh, monument. The other thing that's happening at the end of the 19th century is there is not yet uh, a federal income tax. So some individuals have a lot of disposable income 
and they build great big houses, but they also sometimes build beautiful mausoleums. Garrett Hobart, who is buried up by Patterson, was vice president of the United States, and he has a beautiful little Greek temple there to spend all eternity in. My favorite, all-time favorite mausoleum is for Gottfried Kruger. And you may not know Gottfried, but you know something that his company invented. They were the first company to successfully put beer in a can. They put beer made from the fine water of the Passaic River into cans, and that worked out really well for them. Um, so Kruger beer was world famous, and Gottfried did very, very well. Um, you can imagine when they put up his mausoleum, if you were like the local prosecuting attorney, the high school principal, the bank manager, and then Gottfried arrives. And it's just like the pyramids have been built right next door. It's impressive inside too. I like to think of it as a permanent frat party. Uh, there's enough room for one, two, three, four, five. So that's 10, 22 people on this level. There's a whole sub crypt. So it's really, it's really impressive. Other folks also wanted mausoleums, perhaps not quite as wealthy as Mr. Kruger. Uh, George Frederick Harms, uh, buried up in Jersey City, visited Egypt after King Tut's tomb was discovered. He was pretty impressed, came back, wanted his own pyramid. It's only about 12 feet tall, but it's pretty great. He even has two sphinxes that look a lot like Rudy Valentino. Uh, the 1920s and 30s movie actor. Sometimes in mausoleums, they have really beautiful stained glass windows, such as this one of an angel, or this one of a young girl in New Brunswick, uh, we think by the Tiffany uh, Company. This is the Parthenia Downing Mausoleum, uh, also in New Brunswick. Uh, a great story here in that when uh, Mr. Downing passed away. His wife not only had this beautiful mausoleum erected, but she also paid uh, for uh, an endowment to have a light on forever inside uh, the mausoleum. And it's still shining today, though I'm sure they've replaced the bulb uh, more than once. Now, we're not all great captains of industry, so sometimes you can't afford your own mausoleum. The alternative was. A community mausoleum. So here's the Fairmont Memorial in Newark, uh, big enough to hold about 2,000 of your closest friends, so the size of a small college. Um, when my colleague Mark Nonestied and I visited, we were inside, we were there at Christmas, and they were playing the chipmunks as we walked down the hall. So imagine, you know, Alvin, Theodore. It was a little bit jarring. They shared some of their promotional literature. Um, and I particularly like this. This is why you don't want to be buried in a cemetery. Notice it's raining and dreary and gloomy and nobody's paying any attention and kids are clinging. And here you are back at the Fairmont and everybody's paying attention and we're, we're dry and clean and it's hygienic. What an improvement. The other thing that happens in the 20th century is the invention of the Memorial Park which starts uh, with a fellow named Hubert Eaton uh, out in California and it moves east. And Eaton says cemeteries have become unsightly. They're just full of all, they're like a mishmash of monuments. It's just a mess. And he feels that memorial parks are much more beautiful. This is the George Washington Memorial Park. Again, a very nice gate, very sort of 1930s style. And typically they have beautiful landscaping, reflecting ponds, um, sculpture, and markers that are set flush with the ground. But for sort of the last part of my talk, other, other folks are doing their own thing. Um, and those cemeteries are often the most interesting, at least, at least to me, someone who loves uh, material culture. So this is a Jewish cemetery in Newark, and the designs are completely different. Uh, one of the things that's fun about these markers from the early 20th century is a lot of portraits of the individuals who are buried here. This is another Jewish cemetery. This is in Roosevelt, New Jersey, um, in western Monmouth County. And these individuals, such as Jacob Landau, 
are very, very famous uh, artists um, and writers. Other unusual things you might find, uh, tragedy, tragedies. In this case, shipwrecks along the Jersey Shore. The New Era was a vessel bringing German immigrants to New York City. Sunk in 1854 off Deal Beach, what we would call Asbury Park today. Um, and this monument was erected over the mass grave of the people who died in that terrible shipwreck. Charles Dixon uh, was serving on a vessel when he drowned off the Jersey coast and has a wonderful monument and an anchor as well. New Jersey's African-American population starts to be more visible in cemeteries after the Civil War because so many men served in the armed forces, uh, often in the U.S. colored troops, and were given uh, government-issued markers for their service. So this is the White Ridge Cemetery in Eatontown, and this is uh, William Powell's marker, uh, and you can see he was a private and the 9th U.S. Cavalry. He served in the Indian War. So this is an individual we might call a Buffalo Soldier. This is another great uh, marker in that same cemetery. I think the family name is Richards, and I love the dapper gentleman and his bowler. I mean, he looks, he looks like he's dressed to go out on the town. He looks very classy. Other immigrant groups are uh, rushing into America in the late 19th century. So we see uh, iron crosses like this for people from France and Germany and Austria. Italian immigrants often came and were very poor, uh, but once they had uh, some capital would start to erect elaborate monuments, such as this one for Andrea Massi, who was a trumpet player. And you can see he's still got his trumpet there. You don't need, as people found out in the 20th century, you don't need uh, an expensive gravestone uh, to commemorate someone. So concrete and bathroom tiles seen here in a Polish cemetery in Linden, New Jersey, makes a pretty nice gravestone. And it's a piece of folk art too. Um, this dates from 1929. The back of it, I should have a picture of the back, but I don't, says Frank Blasco, builder, Linden NJ, and it gives you his four digit phone number. So you could have called him up and said, Frank, I love it. Can, and I've got some bathroom tile. Can you make one for me? Ukraine is in the news because of the horrific fighting going on there as, as uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. We have a wonderful Ukrainian cemetery and cathedral here in South Boundbrook, New Jersey. Uh, and this Kazakh is uh, one of the many magnificent monuments by St. Andrew's Cathedral. And the first time I saw this, I was, I was pretty distracted. I came around a big boxwood and this guy was staring at me and I nearly dropped my camera. Uh, pretty intimidating. These are some other Ukrainian markers. Um, Yaroslav Kulnik was a film producer and here he is with his camera, be great. And Mikola Zaborski was an engineer of bridges. So notice his permanent suspension bridge. One sort of less well-known ethnic community we have in the state is a Romani or gypsy community, and they erect magnificent memorials. So this is a gypsy or Romani memorial for Estevano Costello. Not exactly modest. The international legend, a powerful man known all over the world. And it's like a resume in stone. And you could see Estevano and his wife here, um, his older individuals. Here you could see them younger. I mean, it's just, it is amazing. You'll note that he invented a type of modern art siding for buildings. There's a lot going on. This is another uh, Romani grave marker. This is Evergreen Cemetery in Hillside. It's for singing Sam Stevens, the music man. Notice his record, and his guitar. And these are his greatest hits. I don't, I don't know any of them, I have to tell you. So I assume they are gypsy greatest hits. Uh, maybe not on the top 40 counting, but still pretty cool. Big G and Lovable Rose, also Romani. And, um, and I love, there's almost sort of a sense of humor here, right? Lovable Rose, Big G, George. George has passed a, a long, away uh, 
Rose was still with us when I took the picture. In Ocean County, we have a Buddhist population. And this is uh, in Cassville uh, by St. Vladimir's Church. And you can see a Buddhist prayer wheel on top of this marker. And then note the names. They're very uh, Russian sounding, Natalia Madvinova, Hail Sergeyevich. But the pictures as well, these are folks who are displaced uh, during and after World War II and immigrate to the United States as refugees. Modern Chinese cemeteries, wow. Um, they're colorful and they're often uh, arranged to Feng Shui principles. This is uh, Woodbridge's Cloverleaf Memorial Park. We have Muslim cemeteries. This is a Turkish cemetery uh, up uh, by uh, Patterson. So here's Mount Ararat between Father and Mecca Ali. And there's the Great Mosque in Istanbul. And instead of the Bible, the Quran. And Egyptian markers with pyramids. Again, New Jersey is fantastic because of its diversity. There's some wonderful folk art. These are ceramic grave marks. And there's some not all that far from you guys in Rocky Hill, but these are in um, Perth Amboy. Uh, actually, I'm misspeaking. There are a lot in Perth Amboy. These particular examples are in Metuchen. And they were made by people who worked in the ceramics industry. Even though it looks like granite, it's not. It's actually uh, fired ceramic, terracotta. These are also ceramic gravestones. Uh, Danish and English immigrants, really beautiful. This is my favorite example of ceramic. This is for a young man, Bruno Grandellis, if you see him here. Uh, he's in, buried in Metuchen's Hillside Cemetery. The back says, uh, in Italian, your father made this, AD 1905. So it really reflects a family tragedy. And the elder, uh, Jeremiah Grandellis, was a famous sculptor who came to America and made the bronze doors on the Library of Congress. There's some bad ideas in cemeteries too. This is a plastic grave marker I saw in Tuckerton, New Jersey. And um, I'm just nervous about it and somebody mowing the lawn and not paying enough attention. So uh, I'd recommend something a little bit more permanent. There's humor in strange stories too. So check out this marker for Charles H. Salmon. Or in 1858, wax strung, developed into a noble son, a loving brother, came to his death the 12th of October, 1884, by the hand of a careless drug clerk and two excited doctors in Kansas City. What happened? I want to know the rest of the story. We have military service commemorated on stones. Abram Phil Howard died in France serving with the U.S. Army the First World War, here he is in his uniform. We have people's hobbies. There's a stamp collector's gravestone with a stamp on it. We have humor. Uh, and these are some of my favorite humorous markers. In case anyone needs an electrician, the bad news I have for you is Sal Giardino, the world's greatest electrician, has passed away. But done an outlet on a stone, which I think is pretty cool. And he's got his license number up here in case you want to check his references. His daughter, Kim, has also passed away. And notice the world peace here, pretty fantastic. Maybe the greatest gravestone of all time in New Jersey is the Ray C. Uh, monument in Linden's Rosedale, Rose Hill Cemetery. Um, it's a life-size granite Mercedes Benz carved out of one block of granite. It's going to last for centuries. It even has vanity plates, believe it or not. Bruce Berman is in Rawway's uh, Hazelwood Cemetery. If you think about, it's, it's, I think it's Han Solo who's cryogenically frozen in the start. This, when I see this, I think of that. Uh, Mr. Berman was an art and design professor at William Patterson University, and he and his students came up with this design. The other thing that I really love about it is it has his web address, www.bermananimation.com down here. So you can check out his art even today. So I think that Hamilton is still the hardest 
uh, musical to get tickets to on Broadway. But you can visit Aaron Burr almost any time you want. He's buried in Princeton. Um, he's a fairly modest stone that notes that he was a colonel in the Army of the Revolution and he was vice president of the United States. Um, so a famous uh, or perhaps infamous local resident. Dudley Moore, a uh, famous movie actor, is uh, very close to where I live in uh, Scotch Plains. And I love the fact that he has a piano shaped gravestone. There's some very sad cemeteries too. It's not all humor. Uh, this is um, in Hamilton Township, a prison cemetery. And this is probably the saddest cemetery I've visited in that here individuals have been reduced simply to numbers, uh, not even their names on the line. But I don't want to be too much of a downer, so a little more humor. Here's Doris DiCarlo. Notice she has bingo in heaven. That's like permanent bingo, I think. Marvin Pinn, um, a fellow I knew years ago, is characterized very accurately as a family man and a mensch. William Hahn in Princeton, I told you I was sick. Well, he wasn't kidding. And then this is a little bit over the top, uh, but here are the three stooges in, in Metuchen for James Bechtel, the uh, Metuchen firefighter. And another sort of humorous one, John O'Brien is a great cemetery historian from Northern New Jersey, and uh, he loved history. He is history, but he's still very much alive. A critique I had with previous presentations was I didn't do anything with pet cemeteries. So let me give you a couple pictures of those and then we'll wrap up. So here is Squeaker Moshi, a cat, uh, a long lived cat, my best friend, the joy of my life, a Jewish cat, if you will. Killer Vernatico, killer dog, the best dog I ever saw. We love you. I've always imagined Killer Vernatico is like a teacup poodle. Uh, with his big name and his big personality. So cemeteries are important sources of information about our past as a society and the people who've made it up. Unfortunately, many of them are endangered. Endangered due to vandalism, uh, as you see here in a Jewish cemetery in Newark. Endangered due to neglect, as you see here in a colonial cemetery in Colts Neck, completely overgrown by briars. But I like to think that if we take the time to look and listen, they have wonderful stories to tell us about our past as a society. And uh, this is Mrs. Coutroneo in Oceanport. And I love the fact that she seems to be listening to the stone. And the backstory here is that uh, Mrs. Coutroneo had, I believe, two sons, and she would always stay up late at night waiting for them to come home. And um, if they were late, she was very anxious. But when she heard their car pull in on the gravel driveway next to her house, she could go to bed and rest assured that everyone was fine. When she passed away, her sons commissioned a monument that showed mom sitting up waiting for them and listening for them, essentially keeping an eye on them. And I think it's sort of a metaphor in stone for, for us today listening and looking to the stories that these stones have to tell. So thank you. I know I went on and on, but thank you so much for your attention this evening. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm happy to take any uh, questions, um, any comments, any corrections, whatever, whatever you'd like. And I see some over here already. Um, let's see. Um, Oh boy, there are a lot. Great information about Thomas Warren. Wow. So Warren and Lyle um, have sort of local connections. The Metuchen Revolutionary War Cemetery is, is awesome. Uh, Rita is correct. Put that on a list if you're doing a day trip. Um, uh, Père Lachaise is the perhaps world's most famous cemetery in Paris. One of the first, it's worth a trip. It's where Jim Morrison of the Doors is buried and many other notable individuals. Uh, oh, cool that there's a zinc marker 
Yeah, they last and last. They're really pretty fantastic. There's great folklore about the zinc markers that say that during Prohibition, people would unscrew the plaques on the side and they'd hide liquor inside. Um, I've been looking, but I haven't, I haven't found any uh, 100-year-old bottles of scotch. Um, the stamp on that gravestone in Rawway is the inverted Jenny, which is a really, like, if you have an original inverted Jenny, that's a very val valuable poster stamp. Scotch Plains, especially the Baptist churches, it, churchyard is fantastic, well worth a visit. Lots of thank, thank all of you for coming on tonight. Um, all right, any any other questions for the audience? Yeah, well, great. Well, thank you for doing this. And again, thank you for being here. We we actually do have a number of uh, questions that Nile and I have been collecting uh, since we started. And again, if people have questions, you can post it in the chat. Um, I, I guess I'll start with the first one, which is a common question. Um, the a lot of times gravestones face uh, or or you know burials face east to west or yes. west to east. Uh, what are some of the common reasons for that? So the reason that I've always heard presented was that you would have, actually you'd, so you'd have your, if you have two stones, a headstone and a footstone, the footstone would be further east and the headstone would be a little bit further west. And it was because people believed in almost a literal resurrection. So Christ would appear again, almost rising like the sun in the east. And folks were supposed to sit up in their graves and see this. And if you weren't oriented the right way, I guess the thought, uh, the concern was that you might miss the event, uh, it's problematic. So uh, that's that's how I've heard that heard that explained. And that largely seems like when we excavate burials, which we don't, we try not to do lightly, uh, that often appears to be the case. Um, awesome, and yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I've. As far as like famous cemeteries, I've been to the Hollywood Cemetery in Virginia, but that's the only one I've like walked through. But this makes yeah. me want to walk through more in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> Hollywood is worth visiting. That's a famous one. Yeah, that, that was really nice to walk through. Very well maintained, obviously. Um, I switch uh, leads me to my question. So how um, are grave markers maintained? And I guess like how often should they be maintained to be kept up well? Yeah, that's a great question. So with uh, granite grave markers, the sort of gray or black stone, uh, those last very well on their own with minimal maintenance, just, you know, occasional washing is good. Um, but even that is not always needed. The, the marble markers that are earlier that are white or sometimes light gray in color, um, they are hard to maintain because we live in an area with acid rain that, that eats away at them. Um, but one of the worst things that can happen is if they fall down, uh, then the uh, water sort of pools on top of them and it, it erodes them even faster. So keeping them upright is important. Uh, sandstone markers, sort of our earliest markers, last pretty well unless water starts to get into them and freeze, in which case it pops them apart. Um, there are conservators who uh, do really wonderful work. There's a fellow, Gary McGowan, that I've worked with, and he can literally he injects grout into the stones and holds them back together. He saves stones that I thought would, you know, would just fall apart. So each one's a little bit different. But, you know, the most important thing I would say is uh, with burial grounds is to sort of keep them mowed and keep huge trees out of them. Um, and that, that tends to, so long as they look good, people tend not to litter in them and in sort of an easy way to help preserve. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, we, we have another question. Have any cemeteries, in, well, it's actually a twofer, have any cemeteries in New Jersey been converted into parks as they do in Denmark, apparently? And where was the grave in Ringwood located? Uh, so the grave, well, I'll start with the second one. The grave in Ringwood is very close to uh, a small plot up there uh, for Robert Erskine Um Ringwood Manor, and Erskine is like George Washington's map maker during the Revolution, and he has a nice restored gravestone. Uh, so it's it's very close to that. Um, in terms of cemeteries, so yes, uh, in some cases cemeteries have been turned into parks, and it's in New Jersey. I would say it may it may have worked out better in Denmark uh, than here. Sometimes it it has not worked out so well. 
Uh, this happened in New Brunswick. I'm aware of a cemetery that was turned into a park and it was sort of forgotten. People forgot that it was a park. They thought it was just like an open lot and then there were sort of a mess because there was an attempt to develop it and then they remembered uh, that it was actually a cemetery. So um, that happens occasionally. Ever, uh, there was a large cemetery, Evergreen Cemetery in New Brunswick. They also fought to do the same thing. They were gonna remove all the gravestones. They got sort of halfway through the project and then family members said, wait a minute, we don't want our ancestors' gravestones removed. So uh, a little challenging sometimes. Um, so I guess I'll, I have two questions that are um, kind of similar, so I'll ask them together. Um, so how common now are non-denominational, uh, non sorry, non-denominational <laughs> markers? Um, and how common are pet markers now versus before? <laughs> yeah, so they're both, I think they're a great question. They're both becoming more common. So uh, non-denominational burials, I would say are, are almost becoming the norm. Um, and pet markers, there is an incredible pet cemetery in Sussex County, uh, New Jersey. There's a great one uh, down by Atlantic City. So, um, yeah, I think people have relationships with their pets that are, well, I certainly do. In fact, my, my dog just walked in and sat down behind me. She must have heard us talking. Um, you know, it's like a family member. And I think uh, we see people really trying hard to commemorate and show their love for uh, their their pets in, in pet cemeteries. Great, thank you. Um, I, I guess uh, one other question that we had is actually, so so there, there it's, you know, relatively common that uh, uh, if there's a family marker, they, they might list the, you know, the patriarch first. Mm -hmm. Have you run into any markers where it was either the, or the matriarch or somewhere else, someone else listed, like as the uh, head of the gravestone? So, well, I don't know. I'm going to have to start looking for that. I, I, I hadn't thought about that. That's, that is, I bet there, there must be some out there, uh, but I haven't looked. So, all right, I'm going to put that on my, uh, give me some homework. Um, but that, that would be interesting to see. That would be really interesting. Um, uh, next question is, uh, how often are the materials for uh, the gravestones imported or harvested locally? Yeah, so... Um, I guess if we look through time, so the earliest markers, the sandstones and field stones, those were really local. That was like New Jersey stuff. And then we're going a little bit further afield with the marble to Pennsylvania and maybe Vermont. And then with the granite even further, Vermont, New Hampshire, Georgia. And today, um, I understand from interviewing a gravestone carver, they can get stone from all over the world. And some of the most colorful stuff is coming from uh, Brazil, uh, China, and uh, and even the Middle East. So it's gone from very local stones carved by like local craftsmen to this international marketplace. Uh, and so we're seeing much more colorful markers because of that. Great. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I, I was actually wondering if you could share your screen again, because I have a question about uh, that someone brought up about one of the gravestones, and it's about the uh, one carved by Ebenezer Price. Oh, the sure. The, the little coffin at the bottom. Yeah, let's, we'll go back to that. And I saw there was a question about Lenape uh, grave marker. So the, the Native American markers I showed earlier are, are modern markers, but they're, they're certainly for uh, Lenape, and we know that in the uh, colonial period, the Lenape would erect wooden markers over the graves of their loved ones. Uh, a little bit different forms for men and women. Okay, so Ebenezer Price, was it this one? It was the one right below, number 20. Number 20. Ooh, yes. So there seems to be a, you know, a small hand in the bottom left of there. Uh, can, can, is that just pointing towards the name, Ebenezer Price, or? Yeah, there is, <laughs> good eyes. Yeah, there is a little hand over here, and it's pointing out uh, Ebenezer Price uh, sculpted it. 
So I think it's it's like, look over there. I did this. I he's it's funny. He signs a fair number of his stones. He carves in Elizabeth really from a 1760s to 1780s. He trains a bunch of apprentices. Um, he may have trained the Osbournes. Um, and I think this is a marker that for whatever reason he was really proud of. And that's why we have that little hand, hand pointing. We even have a, a runaway ad from him. He had apprentices. One of his apprentices runs away and he puts an ad in a newspaper. I forget. The apprentice might have been Abner Stewart. He basically says, my apprentice, Abner Stewart, who is tall and blue eyed and about wearing this sort of clothing, ran away last weekend. Um, and uh, he was in a fight in town. But I'm not mad. He should come back. And and he does come back, we know, because when Price passes away, um, uh, Abner Stewart takes over his shop. So uh, clearly they had a good relationship. But, uh, I wish I knew more. I I keep hoping to, that someone will find, like, in their attic, Ebenezer Price's diary. And it will say, like, I decided to carve this one this way because Mrs. Eckley really made me laugh or something. So I don't know. I keep hoping for something to show up like that. Yes. Um, okay, next question is, uh, did Quakers have their own cemeteries? Yes, yes. And that is something I, I should have done better in the talk. Mm -hmm. um, so Quakers um, do have their own cemeteries and often they'll have either very small markers that are all the same size, or in some cases, they won't have any markers at all. Um, because Quakers, uh, much like the Moravians that I mentioned before, the Quakers thought every, all people are equal in the eyes of God. So having a big fancy gravestone is just like pride and pride is a sin. So no need for that. Um, in fact, doing research, I found Shrewsbury, New Jersey, close to where I teach, has a Quaker meeting house and a burial ground. And they had a record from the 1700s of how an individual member of the meeting tried to put up a gravestone over a loved one in the cemetery. And the other folks in the meeting found it so offensive that they went out and they smashed it. And, and they said, you don't, you don't need that. Um, you certainly bury your loved one, but you don't need a big fancy stone. So. And actually something to add on to that uh, uh, um, is that there is a Quaker cemetery very near to West Windsor. Um, it's the, uh, uh, the Stony Brook Friends Meeting House in Princeton at the intersection of Quaker Road and Mercer Road. Uh, it's right next to the Princeton Battlefield. And that community had been, that's been a Quaker community in that area since about 1709. So if you're, you know, if anyone's interested in visiting a Quaker gra graveyard nearby, it's only, you know, it's, it's literally a three minute drive from the border of West Windsor. Um, so the next question actually we have from someone who has a headstone on their property that's dated from 1856. Um, and uh, it's apparently totally intact. And uh, they were told that it was made out of the hardest marble existing. And just off the, you know, if you happen to know what, uh, do you happen to know what, what uh, kind of marble that might be? I do not know what the hardest marble in existence is. That's a great question. I don't know. I think yep. of uh, Italian marble, uh, Carrera marble as being some of the finest to carve, but I don't know if it's the hardest. Um, so that is, that's completely intriguing. Sorry, I don't have more information. Uh, okay, uh, last question on my end. Um, but uh, do any cemeteries have a spot for cremated remains? In fact, uh, that's a good, yes, many do today. Um, because one of the challenges with traditional cemeteries is that they run out of space. And, um, and then it becomes, since they typically make uh, their money by selling grave plots, once they run out of space, uh, they often have financial troubles. And a solution to that has been uh, putting cremain sections in, uh, in historic cemetery. Uh, Christ, uh, Christ Episcopal Church in Shrewsbury has uh, a cremains area. But I know a, a number of others do. 
Um, and I, so someone just um, said in the chat, I guess going off of that, um, how about eco green cemetery? So I know it's like becoming more popular for people to like plant a tree or, um, it's, or something instead of a stone. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, there are some places in New Jersey there. I don't have the, there's one in Southern New Jersey near Bass River uh, that specializes in ecologically friendly burials where, yeah, again, where you plant a tree and rather than having a gravestone, you'd have an app on your phone that allows you to like, use the GPS in the phone to get to the location. Um, and rather than uh, using embalming chemicals and um, maybe a metal coffin and a concrete crypt, they use biodegradable materials, whether it's wood or bamboo. So, uh, yeah, that is that is a growing trend. I would say both cremation and green burials are, are growing trends. And they're probably good trends. I think they're uh, certainly green burials are more environmentally friendly. Uh, the chemicals they were using in embalming in the late 1800s definitely killed off bacteria, but they, uh, they included things like uh, arsenic and, and other materials that are very poisonous, very toxic. And actually, someone from the Dutch Neck uh, Presbyterian Church mentioned uh, just in the comments that there is a, uh, a space at the Dutch Neck Presbyterian Church for uh, uh, cremated remains as well. Very nice. Yeah. And I, actually, I was wondering if you can flip to the image of the David Callenhoven's uh, uh, gravestone, the one in the Dutch Neck Presbyterian Church. The reason I, I, I'm interested in that is because before the lecture began, you had mentioned to me that you suspected that uh, 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 you, you might know the name of the carver of that. And I, I'm wondering, uh, I, this is my own personal question, what are the best resources for finding out who made gravestones, usually? Oh, thought I had it there, hold on, let me, there he is. Um, yeah, so this, this could become like an obsessive hobby, also be careful. Um, but there are, there are a couple good sources out, uh, and if you email me, I can send, uh, well, hang on, I can use the chat. Can I chat? Hold on. I don't know if I, oh, well, I'm not being as technologically, uh, savvy as I'd like to. So there are good, uh, books by a fellow Richard Welsh, uh, W-E-L-C-H, uh, another one. Um, by an author called Wasserman, that's her last name. And then um, Mark, Mark Nonis died and I, in, in our book uh, through Rector's Press, uh, which is called Histories in the Landscape, we list a lot of the carvers and when they were active and where we found signed stones. So the style of this carving reminds me of uh, Ebenezer Price's carving, but it's a little simplified in terms of the wig uh, and the wings. And uh, it, so I'm thinking the, the Osbournes, again, Jonathan and Osborne or David Osborne. So uh, Scotch Plains would have a lot of similar markers. And people use, I mean, they try and figure out who carved the stone by. Sometimes there's a signature that makes it easy. Uh, if you don't have that, it's kind of like handwriting analysis. So how do they make different letters? Like, do they have a funny way of making an F or a G? This G is actually kind of distinctive. Um, and trying to figure out the artisans that way, as well as the, the designs themselves. Okay, and then there's one final question, which is, is all this cremation slash eco green slash non-denominational cemeteries going to impact the material culture record or is it just the story of culture changing? Well, let's be optimistic and say it's just the story of culture changing. It will definitely, I think, impact the material record and that, you know, a hundred years from now, I, I wonder if we're still seeing cemeteries as we have them today or if it's all green burials or, or it's, it's all cremation. I've even heard of, you know, there, um, there's a wonderful book 
by it's like Lisa Cullen, and she talks about how people will have their loved ones cremated, and then they'll have the ashes made into um, objects that could be put underwater with concrete. Like the ashes are mixed in with concrete to make uh, artificial reefs for fish to swim through. Or people will have uh, loved ones' remains cremated, and then they'll have them made into an artificial diamond. I mean, the things folks are doing today are fascinating. Uh, it's completely different. So I guess there probably will be a material record, but it's going to be different than what it was in the past. But that says something about us, and that's kind of cool. Okay, great. Well, I, I think that's it for the questions. So, uh, so I see the comment there. Uh, I think that's it for the questions. So once again, thank you very much, you know, for being here, for presenting all this, you know, very fascinating, uh, oftentimes comedic information. Um, and, you know, very intriguing. Once again, thanks. Well, Paul, thank you. Nyla, thank you as well. You were great hosts. I really appreciate it. And everybody have a good evening. Okay. Yes, everyone have a great night. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone.